River Tay in Scotland is one of the world's greatest salmon rivers. As it flows through its scenic and historic valley, the Tay drains an area of some 2,000 square miles and has by far the largest salmon run of any British river. Fresh salmon enter the river throughout the fishing season and beyond, and it was here on the Glendelvine boat pool in October of 1922 that Miss Ballantyne, the Gillies daughter, landed the British record salmon weighing a staggering 64 pounds. It's also here on the Myrtley Castle water, in the shadow of Miss Ballantyne's cottage, that one of Britain's best known salmon fishermen and casting instructors, Michael Evans, runs his spring courses. Some people think there's little to be learned about salmon fishing and that it's all a question of luck. You drop a fly into the water, a fish is there and he grabs it. But I know from years of teaching that if you improve your skills, you significantly increase your chances. Not only that, you also increase your enjoyment of the sport. As a full-time professional fly fishing instructor, tackle designer and writer, Michael travels as far afield as Arctic Russia's Kola Peninsula and Iceland's legendary volcanoes, accompanying groups of anglers in search of some of the world's best Atlantic salmon fishing. Michael's tackle designs include his spaycaster and arrowhead range of rods and lines, which you'll see in use throughout this video. The new specially designed arrowhead salmon twin lines have a unique profile that makes spay casting easier with extended front and rear tapers and a weight compensated belly. They're ideally suited for the casts shown on this video. Together with Michael Evans' unique spay caster and arrowhead rods, they make the ideal all-round balanced outfit for the casts and techniques shown here. In these videos, we'll join Michael on one of his Tay salmon fishing courses and also take you to Russia's Kola Peninsula and Iceland, always concentrating on teaching sound techniques and giving practical advice. For most salmon fishing, Michael recommends a 15-foot, two-handed salmon rod with a suitably balanced reel and line to match. A lovely way to fish, them. If you're learning some of these casts for the first time, it's best to use a floating line. And for safety's sake, always tie a piece of wool to the end of the leader, not a real fly. Although Michael isn't wearing glasses for the purposes of filming, you should always wear some form of eye protection when practicing casting and fishing. And finally, take sensible safety precautions when on or near the water. Always wear an appropriate life jacket and use a wading stick. In volume one, we looked at the overhead cast, the roll and single spay casts, and the double spay cast, all demonstrated with a floating line. And I gave some useful tips on salmon fishing. Here in volume two, I'll show you how to do the snake roll, or spiral roll as it is sometimes called, and I'll cover the spay casts using sinking lines, plus more salmon fishing tips and advice. We'll start with the snake roll, and for this I'll assume that you have a sound knowledge of the spay casts, as taught on my course and in volume one of this video series. The snake or spiral roll is a cast that should only be used in a downstream wind, like the double spay cast. The D-loop is formed by a continuous movement of the rod, a lift followed by a rotation of the rod top. This movement makes the D-loop ready to be tapped out across the stream. From another angle, you can see that the rotation is like forming a small letter E in the air with the rod top, and then pausing before tapping the line and fly out across the stream. I'll show you how it goes. Start with the tip of the rod at the water, lift up, rotate the rod, the loop falls into the new position and we cast out. Now you will see it's much more efficient this cast than the double spay cast because the line continues to keep moving all the way into the loop position prior to the hit forwards. 
We're not sweeping it one way and then sweeping it the other way and having too much get stuck in the surface. But actually doing this lift and tuck under is quite tricky. And the best way you can learn this is merely to take a loop of line underneath the rod and practice winding this loop up the rod spring. It looks a bit strange, but it's a very good way to teach your hands to do this movement without moving the upper arm too much. If I wanted to practice off the other shoulder, I merely wind it back again. And you can see the rod spring literally flipping that line as I go. You must not lift the arm up and throw it over because you will throw too big a loop and the line will not switch positions and land neatly. So, let's put the cast into action. Start with the rod pointing at the fished out line. Again, as with all the spay casts, face the target. And here's the movement. Lift, tuck under, pause and hit. It's a tremendously efficient cast, this, and you can cast very long lines with it for the very simple reason the line keeps moving throughout and the cast has the minimum of friction before it takes off again. From the right bank, the cast is still only used with a downstream wind, which keeps the line and fly safely away from the caster. Here are the movements of the cast from the right bank with the right hand uppermost on the rod. The movements are always, first of all, into your own bank is this letter E as if it was looked at from below and the first movement of the E is to sweep in, up and over. So you take the rod top from there and lift in, up, over, let it land and tap forwards. To begin the snake roll, start with the tip of the rod down at the water, lift and counter-rotate both hands until you're back in the launch position and tap it out. Lift into the bank, up, tuck under, pause, the loop forms and tap it out. Lift up, tuck under, pause, hit. Make sure you do not throw the shoulder at it or continue to bowl. Do not do this. Lift, tuck under and go on over and bowl it because the cast will not work. You need to make certain that you actually lock yourself into the launch position prior to the forward hit. Here it is. Lift, tuck under, pause, hit. Now this cast you simply must not attempt to do in anything but a downstream wind. And the fact of the matter is that unless you have a strong downstream wind blowing the loop downwind, the line and fly are moving so fast you run a severe risk that they will come back and strike you before you launch forward. The higher you go with the rod and the bigger the circle, the nearer the line will come to you. And obviously the stronger the wind, the bigger the circle and the higher you can lift. If you've got very little wind indeed. Always, as I said, don't try this cast without a downstream wind. But if you've got very little wind indeed, don't lift very high and do a little tiny circle and you will tend to keep the line away from you. And remember, particularly if you're doing this off your left shoulder, if you happen to be right-handed, or your right shoulder if you're left-handed, just because you've got your weaker arm on the top of the rod does not mean to say you have to compensate by pushing harder. Essentially, you compensate by just making sure you set the cast upright in the first place and make sure you use your good hand to its best advantage down at the bottom of the rod. Remember that little flick. Do not drive forwards in an effort to compensate for the loss of power in your weaker arm. Just tap it forwards and stop sharply. The snake roll is an excellent cast, but it does have its disadvantages. You need room on the water behind you for the relatively large loop to touch down before it is tapped out across the stream. If you're fishing with trees or a steep bank behind, like Arthur Oglesby is on the Ranga River in Iceland, it's better to use a double spay, where most of the line is kept out in front before the forward cast. The disadvantage of the double spay is that as you lengthen line, it becomes increasingly difficult to switch back so much line on the water before the forward cast. And so I would always choose the snake roll if I have enough room, particularly if I want to cast a long line. And in fact, you can lift the sunk line to the surface of the water really very simply on my take course, I teach a special technique for casting a sinking line that makes it almost as easy as casting a floating line. But for a more in-depth look at the challenges of sunk line fishing, let's first go to Russia's Kola Peninsula. Well, of course, most people think that fishing with sinking lines is, is a major chore, uh, and generally that's purely because they haven't taken the trouble to learn the techniques used to cast with them. 
Um, for me, sunk line fishing um, has extra interest because you're working in three dimensions. Uh, and I will often fish a sunk line uh, at many, many times regardless of the water temperature, although the pundits always tell you that you should only use a sunk line below 48 degrees. I believe it's more important to get the fly to the fish. Well, we've come to this particular pool. Um, I think this looks ideal for fishing with a sunk line. We've got a very, very fast run in, which is bound to stop the fish up, and they'll tend to pull over to this side because we're on the inside of the curve. And we've got, therefore, a combination of fairly cold, deep water and so I'm using a fast sink line. That is a line that sinks at about 12 seconds a metre. Now you'll notice when I'm using the sunk line that one of the things I do is always precede each of the casts with that extra roll cast. Now that is purely to get the line and fly onto the surface. And the easy way of remembering how to do that I call it just tap and go. It means that instead of hauling the line up from the depths and pulling like mad, you just raise the rod gently, lift, 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 like that, tap forwards and don't wait. The important bit is that you don't wait, because otherwise the belly of the line sinks down into the water again and you've defeated the whole object of the exercise of rolling it to the surface in the first place. Let's look at this technique in more detail. First you must lift the rod slowly without bending the rod spring so that the line starts to come to the surface and a loop of line forms behind the rod ready for the roll cast. Then you hit forwards in order to roll the rest of the line onto the surface. But instead of stopping the rod at 10 o'clock as you would normally, let the rod drift forward so that the rod top is down at the water ready for the start of your spay cast. Then you just carry on with the spay cast. It's very important that you don't stop between the first roll cast, the tap, and the final cast, the go. This is because you don't want the belly of the line to sink back into the water. So the idea is you tap, drift forwards, and then just carry on as if everything was as it should be, and you were using a floating line. And you find, actually, that any sort of cast following that roll cast is very straightforward. Here we go again. Let's draw in the last three yards and see if the fish is following. Lift, 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 let the current pick it up, tap, don't wait, and carry on. Always remember, slowly with sunk lines. Those of you who are overhead cast obviously can use that initial roll cast to get the line to the surface, but when you're normally fishing with this type of gear, you've got a fairly heavy fly on the end, and having once had a two-inch brass tube in the back of the head at speed, I would never overhead cast with a sunk, sunk line and a heavy fly ever again much safer to learn to spay cast and also you're not likely to crack the fly off on a stone behind you and there's no joke the salmon loves better than a fly with no hook on the end i'm actually tending to cast and then move a little bit to give the line some extra time to sink all the while feeling the resistance of the pressure of the current on the line and fly and looking that right amount of pressure, just, oh, and we've got one. Lift straight into it, as I always do with the sunk line. Once he's felt the hook, he's either got it or he hasn't. Never wait. Just lift straight in and set the hook. And then, for good measure, bend into it again, just to make quite sure that it's home. If it's going to come out, it'll come out straight away. I do tend to give fish a fair amount of pressure. Oh, don't you do that. Hear that line sing, look at that. Oh. I'll try and bring him back in, he's seen you. Hooray! Fine salmon. Thank you, Pasha. <laughs> what a beauty. If you're going to do a double spray car, which you would be obviously doing in a downstream wind, you actually don't need to worry about the roll cast bit at all, because the, the sweep upstream, or that initial bit where you cross the hands over, 
will actually tow the line to the surface of the water for you. This lift here, lift there, and that tow upstream, slowly remember, and then lift, swing, hit, will actually get the line unstuck for you and put it out across the surface. It is the lift or the drag which is bringing the line and fly up to the surface. No problem at all, as long as you take it smoothly. You mustn't jerk with the sunk line. The moment you jerk, all that happens is the rod spring bends and the line and fly don't move. So don't be frightened of sunk lines. Just take it gently. We may want to vary the angle of our cast from a shallow angle downstream to square across the river. To make the spay cast most efficient, the pitch or angle of the line landing in the water after the lift and sweep should face the intended direction of the cast. In order to alter the angle at which the line pitches into the water, we do what a lot of people do naturally but don't understand why, and it's called an in-cut. If I want to change the pitch of the line landing in the water to be there instead of there, all I do is lift in an equal and opposite way off the water to start. And it's more complicated in, in theory than it is actually in practice. Or, as always, face the target. For a shallow angle cast, obviously face almost directly downstream because we're only going to cast a short angle out. And with this one, you just need a, an almost vertical lift there, a sweep back to there, and a tap forward. If you want to go for a wider angle cast, then obviously turn to face the wider angle target, and then lift equal and opposite away from the target towards your own bank. Lift 45 degrees into the bank there will give you a 45 degree change out to there. If you want to go for a very wide angle cast, I'll just put that back, you stand square onto the target there, and you'll lift initially right into the bank there, come right round and up, and the line strikes facing right out square across the river. Lift two, three, sweep two, three, and tap it forward. With the normal spay cast, I've taught you obviously to lift the rod, to sweep round and up, keep as much line off the surface of the water, and cast out with that short tap. Now, a lot of people think that to get a bit more distance, you've got to put some more welly into it. But unfortunately, the moment you try and put welly in on the way forward, all you will do is open the loop and then get no line shooting out because that big wall of line is trying to cut into the wind. So, the way to increase distance with a single spay cast, I loosely call the accelerated spay. And instead of making a little bit more effort on the way forwards, what you do is increase the weight in the loop behind. And we do this by using the left hand during the sweep. There's the lift, there's the sweep, push out with the left hand, and you will see that the loop goes much further back behind me, and there's much more momentum, and therefore much more rod load, before you then flex the rod and tap the loop forward. There's nothing more awkward than a wind blowing straight at you. The only thing you can do to improve this is really, again, to use more left hand, but this time use the left hand on the final flick. Instead of just sweeping up and stopping quite high with the rod there and letting the wind blow the line down towards you, and in fact we've got exactly that wind at the moment, and you can see that the moment I stopped high, none of the spare line ran out. However, if on the way forwards this time, I keep the rod fairly high and pull substantially harder with the left hand and really tuck it up underneath my armpit, which, as you remember, is the one thing I told you not to do when we were doing the ordinary spay cast. That will drive the loop much tighter and much lower towards the water. In fact, without a headwind, this cast wouldn't work. It would just crash into the deck. But the headwind actually keeps it up. Lift up, sweep, and pull right up with the left hand and you can see the extra power delivered off it. Once you've improved your casting, it is then merely a question of being able to read the river and knowing where to best concentrate your efforts.
In volume one, I showed you how to judge the height of the water and where resting fish were likely to be lying in the pools. A more detailed look at the river will tell us the line that the salmon will take as they swim upstream. And the first thing you must look at when you come down to the water is not the water itself, but the topography around it. And if you actually take this pool, which is a very good example, if you look up behind us here, if you look up behind us here, you've got a huge high escarpment there on the left bank, and yet you've got a fairly flat area here on the right bank. Now that immediately tells me that the deeper area or the deeper channel on the river is going to be on that bank. But if you follow the pool down and into the next pool around the corner, you'll see the high escarpment is on the right-hand side and the lower, flatter plain is on the left-hand side. And that immediately tells me that the main channel of the river has actually crossed over and has come onto the right bank down around the corner there. The higher the water level, the more the salmon will take the line of least resistance. So let's just assume we were looking at this pool now and it was much, much higher water, say another two, three foot on it. The salmon would tend to come up the shallower side that had the least current. And so it would tend to come up round the corner, taking the inside of the bend, because that is going to be the slackest current, and that is where the shallower water is. And then it would have to cross over to this side and come up the shallower, slacker area up this side of this pool. And you can see in higher water, those stones would be under the water and all the shingle would be under the water. And in very high water, I'd expect the salmon literally to be running up this bank. However, as we are today, the water is fairly well done. And so in lower water on any pool, I would expect the salmon to be sticking to the deeper channel because the current won't be too fierce for them and yet they've got the protection of the slightly deeper water. So in lower water, I would tend to fish from the deeper side and in high water, I would prefer to fish from the shallow side. That's assuming that I have the option to fish both banks, which isn't always the case. Here at Merthley on the Tay, in comparatively low water for the time of year, I've hooked a fish on the deep water side close into the bank. As you will see, an additional bit of advice when fishing from the deep water side is to remember to take a net or tailor, because there is not always a convenient place to beach it. I was lucky not to lose this one. If you're not quite sure when to use a full sinking line or a sink tip, here's a useful guide to making that choice. If you're on the shallow water bank, casting across towards the deeper water and fishing the fly back across the river into the shallow water, then a sink tip will allow the fly to sink immediately in the deeper water and then the floating portion of the line will pull the fly up in the water as it swings into your own bank. If you are on the deep water bank casting across to shallow water and fishing the fly back across the river into deep water, then a full sinking line will continue to sink as it crosses the stream and go on down into the deeper water. You can also vary the size, type and weight of the fly to affect the depth. Remember though that a heavily dressed fly will sink much more slowly than a lightly dressed fly, regardless of size. Oh, there we go. But a good way of judging where you should start or finish in the pool is basically look for where the fast water first comes in. Where the fast water comes into the neck of the pool, there is usually an area of slack water formed where the current moves away from the bank. This V-shaped piece of water can be very productive because it is where fish will stop before tackling the rapid. The most important thing about fishing this area is not to start at the V itself because you will be on top of the fish. Instead, walk two rod lengths further upstream, then when you unhitch your fly and start fishing, you will cover these fish. And many, many times I've gone to a pool and literally just unslung the fly, dangled it in the water, bang, and off oh, he goes. And he's on. And that is a very good place to catch fish. The next best place, and possibly even better still, are where two currents meet. You'll always hear rivers have famous pools called junction pools that are classic fish-holding pools. And the reason for that is when fish come up into a pool, once they meet a junction or where two currents meet, they have to make a decision as to which way to go. 
And it is at that point they will stop in order to think about it and very often collect there in quite large numbers trying to decide which way to go. And here you can see we've got an island in the middle of the river. Part of the current comes down the right-hand bank and the main part of the current comes down the left-hand bank. And the classic taking spot right here in this particular pool is where those two currents meet right out here, dead in the middle. The next thing you need to look for are boils. And boils are where the water has flowed over an underwater stone and created that sort of glassy uh, boil on the surface. In my experience, fish very rarely lie behind stones under the uh, on the riverbank. They tend to lie either beside them or in front of them. And the reason for that is as the flow comes down against the stone, it walls up on the front of the rock, and therefore it is there where there is the calm water that the fish likes to lie. So he literally sits in that wall of water that's trying to push its way around the stone. And very often they'll lie just slightly to the side where the current peels off, which is almost like the miniature version of the V we're talking about here. It's where the current steers off to one side and just leaves a slack on the edge of it. In my experience, fish don't tend to like stones that have white water behind them, i.e. where the stone is so far out of the water or the current is so strong that you get the white water turbulence behind. In my experience, they far prefer a stone that is underwater that merely creates this swirling water that goes down behind, but not the white foam of water. So as a general rule, when I'm going down a pool, I look for that sort of thing. I'm also very keen on looking for outcrops in the river. You can see down here that we've got these three sort of tufts of grass, where grass has grown over rock in the middle of the river. When you see things like that, it means that a similar thing is happening all around them, but underwater. And in that case, it is um, shelves or um, like flat slates of rock on the riverbank that have actually cut um, nice little flat spots for fish to lie on and little vertical cliffs underwater where fish love to be. Fish love drop-offs. They love a flat area and then a sudden drop-off into deep water. The last part of a pool that you need to concentrate very hard on, particularly in the evenings, funny enough, because salmon, when it gets a little bit uh, darker in the evening, salmon are more inclined to come into shallower water are the pool tails. That is the runoff. It's the V-shaped smooth glide as the pool spills over and goes down into the rough water. When the salmon have to come up through a really powerful current, fighting their way up a, a white water rapid, and they find the uh, tail of the next pool up, they'll tend to pull into it and stop and take a breather. And they are very vulnerable then. They're very likely to take a fly when they come into those pool tails. But generally speaking, if you try and think through where the fish are going to be in the, in the pool, try and think of the track they're going to take when they're running up, you can make much more economic effort than you would do if you just say, oh, well, I'll stand here and fish all the way down to the bottom. Try and think it through. Now that you've learned to read the river, Let's just look at the best way to present the fly to the fish. Well, we've just come to a pool called the Duck Pool, and it's just down from Varzuga village. And uh, the beauty of this pool is it's wonderfully, wonderfully calm. And it's what would have been termed in the old days a greased line glide. And that's because you wanted a nice, smooth piece of water with just one or two stones behind which the salmon are going to lie in order to fish with, effectively, a floating line and a sunk fly. Just literally fish two or three inches under the surface. So what we're just going to do is to fish as delicately as we can and pull the speed of the fly as it comes across the stream. So let's just put a, a short cast out to begin with. And we'll just let that settle into the surface. Notice I always keep the rod top above the line. That's to make the fly swim. It's not supposed to be a dead drift. And I like to give it just a little bit of hand line movement just to make the fly that bit more interesting. I'm just extending line about a yard and a half each calf. I'm going to leave them sitting on down a bit until we find a taper. A little bit of a tree, just to give that 
people, but it added life to the fly. Oh, we just had a little rise to the fly, but he didn't touch it. With this, you must wait until you just feel that line begin to move. Oh, look at that. line cutting into the water like that. Well done. Nice fish. Pop him back. Thank you, Pasha. <laughs> But you very rarely get a piece of water where the fly fishes perfectly by itself. So let's look at ways to alter the speed at which the fly crosses the stream. One way of doing this is by casting out and then mending the line. That is throwing the line on the surface of the water in an arc upstream. This will then slow the pace of the fly as it crosses the river towards our own bank. This is particularly useful in fast currents or when the water is cold and the salmon are reluctant to take a fast moving fly. And this can be done several times in one cast if necessary. It is also possible to speed the fly up by doing just the opposite of the upstream men, i.e. throwing the loop of line downstream. This creates what is called a belly in the line, which catches the current much like a sail catching the wind. The fly is then whipped around towards the bank much more quickly. There is one more thing I like to do to give the fly a more lifelike appearance, which I think stimulates the salmon to take sometimes. Once I've cast out and mended the line, I'll pull in a little bit of line with a figure of eight retrieve. This is called hand lining. This is what it looks like in slow motion. You'll notice that I pull some line in with my fingers, and as I do that, I drop the last bit through my hand and down onto the water. The effect it has is to pull the fly forwards against the current and up in the water in little jerks and makes it look more alive. But the key is keeping the fly fishing all the way across the stream. To see how this works in practice, let's go back to Russia's Kola Peninsula. We're fishing in the Sabachi Rapids just below Roxton Bailey Robinson's Lower Varzuga Camp as a guest of Christopher Robinson, one of Roxton's directors and a keen and experienced salmon angler himself. Christopher and I have decided to fish down this pool together uh, more as an experiment than anything else to try the traditional Scottish floating line tactics which I'm using um, as against the, uh, the Russian surface lure or wake lure tactics that Christopher is using. Now one of the most important things whether you're actually on the surface or literally a couple of inches under the surface as I am is to make sure that the small fly that we're using, I've got a, a number six tail fire on here, which is, in salmon fishing fly terms, fairly small, is the salmon, I always think, would not expect to see the fly travelling any faster than a creature of that size might be able to swim against the current or across the current. So I tend to control the speed, and you can see there, there's quite a big bow forming in the floating line as it comes across the current. So the next cast I'm going to do, as I cast out, I will then literally throw a loop of line upstream. And by throwing it upstream, the fly stops. Oh, we just had a little rise to the fly. He just, he didn't touch it at all. 
But now, isn't that interesting? The first time we fished it down, it was traveling a bit too fast, and the second time we put the mend in and we got an offer. Let's give it another go. Stay where we are, we've got the same amount of line out. So if we do what we did before, we should be able to cover the same fish. Throw a little mend upstream again, to slow it down, and this time, as it comes over the fish, I'm going to give a bit of a hand line. Wait, oh, there he is. And we've got him. I just gave it a little bit of a tug. I gave it the mend, and then that little bit of hand movement, which I love to give a fly, just that little figure of eight retrieved, and he took it like a lion. Such fun when they do that. Just splash right up on the surface. Come on, fella, we're going to put you back, so we won't play you for too long. We'll just bring you up on the bank here. Oh, and then I don't like to tire the fish out, so I risk losing them and just bring them straight up onto the bank like that. Wait until he's quiet. Let's come round behind him. Lay the rod down. Let's hold him by the tail. Just take the fly out. Barb this so it doesn't do him any harm. And straight back in the water. There he goes. Whoa. How about that? <laughs> Whilst the two-handed rod is without doubt the most effective tool for spay casting long lines and heavy flies, on smaller rivers, the single-handed rod comes into its own. It can also be great fun to try a skated fly with a single-handed rod in warmer water or when the salmon are lying near the surface. The idea is to fish the fly so that it creates a V-wake on the surface. I designed my water skier fly for just this purpose. Just never know when the surface suddenly erupts. Now it comes with rolling bar of silver. Never touched it either. Perfect goose line fishing. Bruce line, of course, because in the old days when they had silk fly lines, they had to actually put the grease on them to make them stay up on the surface. Oh, God. <laughs> he took me such a rush, the reel went off like mad. <laughs> I struck and he ran off at the same time and that reel did spin. My goodness. He wanted that and no mistake. One of the amusing things, if you call that amusing, about having a reel without a brake on it. And that when they take off, they certainly do take off. Well done, hooray! <laughs> We hope you've enjoyed the second video in Michael Evans' series on spay casting and salmon fishing. For information about Michael's individual tuition and courses, or for a copy of his latest Fly Fisher's Guide, which contains details of accompanied trips and fishing tackle, contact him at the following address.